Good morning, church family. I hope all is well for you. Uh, as you can see, I'm still in my office. Uh, don't worry, I'm social distancing. Uh, it's usually just me and my wife in here um, for most of the week. And so um, that being said, we're trying to keep things as normal and as calm as possible uh, as the Lord allows. And so you're going to see me continue to post these videos. You're going to see me to continue to try to encourage you um, and, you know, I, I want to make things absolutely clear. What this is all about and what this is always going to be about is the glory of God's kingdom and encouraging the saints. You know, um, Christian, before we, we get into our word today, I just want to encourage you. The world needs to see us. Those of you who are in Murfreesboro, you might see me out and about, um, you know, not trying to uh, spread a disease or anything like that. Um, I, I'm I'm avoiding going into places as much as possible, except when I have to get things for my family. Um, but I'm trying to be as as visible and live life as normally as I can amidst all these times, because the fact is Jesus Christ is coming. It may not be today. It may not be in a hundred years, but He's coming, and He's coming for our neighbors, and He's coming for our friends. Um, we are going to be called home at some point or another, whether individually or whether Christ comes back with the sound of a trumpet. And so what we need to do is we need to be beacons and, 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 and bastions of hope. What did Jesus say? A city on a hill cannot be hidden. He says, you are the light of the world. Church, he is speaking of us. We are the light. We are there to carry his light. John said that... Uh, he was the light of the world, and, and the world could not understand him. And, and then he said at his last supper that he's calling us to carry on what he has done. And we are to do greater things. And so I want to ask you, church, call upon him. Get into your word daily and ask the Holy Spirit what you should be doing. Yes, be informed, be wise, be conscious of what's going on. But let the Word of God inform you and the Holy Spirit guide you. That is what we're supposed to be doing. I hope there's some hope and consolation in that. With that being said, let's go ahead and get into our Word today. This is Luke chapter 20, starting at verse 27. Then came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is resurrection. Let's pause there for a minute. What we're seeing here, you might recall it was the Pharisees who tried to trip him up in the last video we did in Luke chapter 20, um, 26 and backward. Um, they were trying to tie him up on taxes. The, the Pharisees sent in spies who pretended to be sincere. This is something we need to be careful. Our adversaries are watching us. That's why I opened the video with what I did. People are, are watching what we do. And what they're always going to constantly try and do is trip us up. And so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, different parties within the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of, of uh, Israel at the time, they were sending all these people to Jesus to try and stump him. Not because they were concerned about necessarily the religious implications about what he was doing. No, their main concern was their own power and position. And everything Jesus did, everything he did, everything he did, was a stumbling block to their own position, authority, and power. So we need to be very careful with that. So that being said, there came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection, and they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children, and the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Afterwards the woman also died. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. Now, I'm going to tell you, this is an all-time stupid question. Sometimes we can be so intelligent, and we can be so smart. Now, think about this. We have a, a, an entire generation of Sadducees. They don't believe in the power or the majesty of God, whether they're atheist, agnostic, or within the church themselves. 
And what we try to do to defend our positions is we come up with the most convoluted things to try and, and, and explain our view of things. And the Sadducees came up with this convoluted question to try and think of their own way of how they believe things. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Stupid joke, I don't care. But they didn't really believe in the power of God. They didn't really believe very much about who God was or what he could do. And I think this is an important thing for us to realize, church. We, we need to make sure that we aren't negating our own faith by asking dumb questions. Now, typically, I'm a fan of the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. But a dumb question with a loaded answer, I mean, they were trying to literally just get Jesus to um, stumble and to stutter and, and to, to uh, make a mistake. That was the only reason for asking it. But I love how Jesus responds. He took it seriously. Listen to this. And Jesus said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain that age and to the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. For they cannot die anymore because they are equal to the angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. I love this. Listen to this. Now he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, Teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Now, before we move on in our scripture, I want you to listen to how Jesus responded. Jesus responded to a silly question seriously. What he was speaking of was not that we shouldn't get married in this life. He was saying that if you're so focused on this, you're missing the point. He was saying to the scribes that you are not asking this question because you're genuinely concerned. You're asking this question because you don't believe there is anything beyond here and now. You believe there is only now, and so therefore you have to get what you want now. But if you listen to what the scriptures say, that he says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, even though Abraham and Isaac and Jacob had been dead for over 400 years. God is acknowledging in that moment that the eternity of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was continuing. That Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though their bodies were dead and buried in the ground, were continuing. Do you hear that? We continue on. There is an eternity. And if we're so focused on the things in this here and now, we are missing out on what God is trying to speak to us in eternity. That we are being called sons and heirs alongside the Son of the living God. That if we're focused upon our real estate here and now, we are missing out on the storehouses of eternity. Jesus is trying to speak to us here, church. Jesus is trying to tell us in now, even though we're not the, the scribes who asked the question, he's trying to teach us here and now that this is a time that we, that we church, need to listen and to hear and to store for ourselves eternal treasures. Here's what he goes on. But he said to them, how can they say that the Christ is David's son. Now you notice, they tried not questioning him again, but he pursued them. For David himself says in the book of the Psalms, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. David thus calls him Lord, so how is he his son? You see, 
Jesus brought it all back to Scripture. They were answering from their earthly explanation. Jesus brought it back to Scripture. Christian, this is our source. It's not CNN. It's not Fox. It's not MSNBC. It's not social media or Facebook. This should inform us. Romans 12, chapter 1 and 2. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, to live as a living sacrifice. And he goes on in verse 2 to say, So do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may know what is the will of God, what is good and pleasing and perfect. Let us then use this as our source for everything. And I'm going to say something. The Sadducees used the scripture to fit their narrative. I'm going to tell you, this should transform our narrative. I shouldn't use the Bible to support my position. My position should be transformed by the reading of the Bible. Does that make sense? I hope it does. And I'm going to ask you, please, 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 let this inform everything you do. Let it inform the shows you watch on television, the games you play with your family or your friends, the things you do online, the things that are on your phone, the things that, that you allow into your house. Let this inform it. And the Holy Spirit will help you. There's that little still small voice that says, maybe I shouldn't be watching this. There's that little tiny thing in, in the back of your mind. Maybe this isn't what I should be doing. Then let us listen to it. And church, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to me. We need to make sure we are letting this transform and inform. The Sadducees were so focused on their point of view. But Jesus said, think on this. David, the king, the first true king, calls his offspring his Lord. David thus calls him Lord. So how is he his son? David recognized that the promise of God even, I was reading this in my own personal study the other day, and it blew my mind that the promise of God to David that his offspring would build him a temple had nothing to do with Solomon and the grand building he built. It had to do with Christ and the temple that is you and I, where God's presence dwells literally inside of us, that we may go out and be lights in the world, that we may go out and be that uh, temple that the offspring of David, the Son of the Most High, the Son of Man who sits at the right hand of the Father, has built. Are you being that temple, church? It's time for us to stop and listen. Now listen, this is what Jesus says afterwards. And this is a warning, not merely to the scribes of his time, but to the scribes of our time. Listen. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive great condemnation. None of this is about us, church. Not a single bit. Not this pandemic. Not this uh, life. Not the things we have. All of it is for the glory of God. Everything we have been given, whether it's one car or many cars, whether it's our homes, our houses, our children, our wives, our husbands, our friends, our, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, Everything God has given us is a gift. And those who walk around who love the recognition, those who walk around in pretense like they're holy people, but really if you watch their behavior, it's contrary to the holiness of God. It's contrary to the, the, the people within the word of God who actually walked upright before God. Abraham didn't pretend to be perfect. He wasn't. But he believed God, and that was counted to him as righteousness. But sometimes we can be the scribes. We can walk around in our religious vestments, our Sunday best, and we can quote scriptures and say long prayers, but we are really devouring the resources of others by our unbelief. I'm praying for you, church. Let us then stand firm and humble ourselves before the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the living God of the living. And let us think that this is not our home. 
that we are just passing through. That instead of focusing on the here and now as the Sadducees did, we can focus on eternity. We can focus on who will meet us there. Specifically Jesus and then those who we bring alongside us. Last night my oldest son uh, was weeping over his brothers. He said, if Jesus comes back now, What's going to happen to them? They have been given their lives. Now, I want you to keep in mind, the youngest two are five and three. And so I gave him assurances. But, you know, what if we had that heart always for all people? What if God comes back now? What's going to happen to my neighbors? What if God comes back now? What's going to happen to my family? What if Jesus returns now? What's going to happen to them? What if that was our mentality, church? Instead of focusing on all this around here, maybe then we would get into the Great Commission. Maybe then we would uh, live and fulfill in our lives the great commandment. God bless you. I'm praying for you. And I hope this is an encouragement to you. The Lord still has need of you, even if you are quarantined. The Lord still desires you to, to be the light of the world, even if you seem to be stuck alone. Don't give up hope. Hope in Christ. God bless.